So let's move on to Repulsive Wallaby, possibly the best researcher on the case, moving the case forward. Perhaps Repulsive Wallaby, on their own, are responsible for this case to being closer to solve than it has ever been before. So credit to Repulsive Wallaby here. Came across this really descriptive early article on Moore's disappearance with some interesting smaller details. It would not let me share the direct article link, but you can zoom in for an easier read. So let's go over this article here. Search for woman continues in Haverhill. So I'm assuming, yeah, this is talking about Fred. He's worried that Maura Murray got into the wrong car after she plowed her black 1996 Saturn into a snowbank on a sharp curve and apparently decided not to stick around until police showed up to investigate the crash. Again, if she was even there. He's worried... Because police are virtually certain that she left the area in a vehicle. Haverhill Police Chief Jeff Williams said Tuesday there were no tracks in the snow around the crash site and state police search dog lost more Murray's scent quickly. It seems likely she got into a car. It could have been a good guy. It could have been a bad guy, said Fred Murray, who is worried primarily that something as bad happened to his daughter to prevent the normally reliable former West Point cadet from contacting him, her boyfriend, her friends, or any of the people she usually keeps in touch with with regularly. Two days before the North Haverhill accident, Maura Murray had smashed up her father's new car in an accident in Hadley, Massachusetts, not far from the University of Massachusetts campus in Amherst, where she is a junior. Fred Murray said yesterday that he and his daughter's boyfriend, Bill Roush of Marengo, Ohio, as well as her friends and siblings, have been trying to figure out if her stress over the first accident would have been enough to cause her to withdraw $280 from a bank account and tell her employers at an art gallery that she'd be away for a week. Interesting. So, no UMPD, just the art gallery being referenced here. She was upset because of the accident in my car. She felt she had disappointed me, let me down like any kid would. I don't think it was anything serious. He said Mora headed for the North Country because it was familiar territory for her. The family had vacationed for years in Lincoln and Conway, New Hampshire area, he said, and liked to climb 10,000-foot peaks. Asked if there was one special place she might have headed for, her father said yes, in Bartlett. I've checked. Nobody's been there, he said. He and his son, Fred Jr., 33, also of Hanson, Mass., have hit all the campgrounds they could find that their family used over the years. They were all locked down and snowed in. Moore's boyfriend, Bill Roush, 23, is an Army lieutenant stationed in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He's in another room at the Wells River Motel. Last night, he dropped in on his parents, Bill and Sharon Roush, of Marengo, Ohio, in their room there, and said he's dreading reporting back for duty some 2,000 miles away if Mora hasn't turned up by the weekend. We were just talking about the future the other day, he said, during one of the regular phone calls he had with Mora. Though not officially engaged yet, he said it was clear to everyone the couple planned to marry and he was going to get out of the service so that they could start a family. New Hampshire State Police let family members retrieve Moore's belongings from the Saturn. Bill Roush is holding on to her favorite stuffed animal, Joseph, a monkey that she had in the car with her, allegedly. The Roushes said they're doing their best to remain upbeat and positive. Sharon Roush said she thinks often of Elizabeth Smart, the Utah girl who was kidnapped and missing for months before police found her and brought her home. He misses her terribly, she said, of her son. It's strange. But when I see her picture on the television, it's hard to believe we're in the middle of this. Is this just a really bad dream, or is it real? She asked. Fred Murray and his son returned to the motel last night after spending much of the day combing the snowy woods in the White Mountain National Forest, not far from the Haverhill site where Mora was last seen. Her father said he followed boot prints over about a half mile of rugged terrain before he saw a clear enough print to determine that they had been made by boots larger than his daughter's size eight and a half shoes. Murray said... His and Roush's family members had, in the past week, papered the area with posters bearing his daughter's photos from central Vermont to Freiburg, Maine, and searched behind miles of roadside snowbanks. No one could fail to see the missing person notices at the Swiftwater Stage Shop, a log cabin-style convenience store not far from the spot where Maura Murray vanished, allegedly. Owner Winnie Madison has them posted on her front door and at the checkout counter. She said yesterday that the disappearance has been a major topic of conversation among customers. Everyone has an opinion. There just isn't anything concrete. But the more time that goes by, the worse it looks, she said. 
Meanwhile, yesterday, a school bus driver, Butch Antwood, whose home is within sight of the crash scene, said he was just about to park his bus on that Monday night at about 8 p.m. when he spotted a car nearly sideways on the road. He rushed down to see if he could help. She spun on the curve, she had no lights on, and it was a dark car. I could just about see it. I put my flashlight in the window. She was behind the airbag. All I could see was from her mouth up, Atwood said yesterday as he stood in his driveway and pointed to the accident spot. I yelled in and she said she was okay. She was shaking as anyone would be if they had just been in an accident. That's an interesting piece of information to add, said 57-year-old Atwood. He described more a struggle to squeeze her way out through the driver's door of the car that he said had sustained considerable front-end damage. I told her I was going to run to the house and call the police. She said, no, 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 please don't. I already called AAA. Well, under my breath, I said, that's a lie. You can't make a cell call from here, Atwood said. Cellular reception is poor throughout the area. Despite the young woman's protests, Atwood said he did summon the police, but when he went back outside, she was gone. I guess I was the last one to see her. I heard a couple of cars go by when I was on the phone. But I didn't see her get in a car, and I just don't know which way she went. We're all just dumbfounded by this, Atwood said. A couple of drivers along Route 112 yesterday afternoon got a surprise when they took a curve, then had to hit the brakes quickly as they encountered one tall police chief and two state troopers walking toward them in the roadway. Williams and Lieutenant John Scarinza, the twin mountain troop commander, plus his second-in-command Sergeant Tom York, examined the crash scene and the surrounding area once again. The Haverhill chief declined to say exactly what the three were doing. But he did say, although there were no new developments yesterday, he was not ready just yet to go along with the fears of the family members that Maura Murray had been the victim of foul play. If any good Samaritan picked her up, please call her. If that's all it is, that person hasn't done anything wrong. She's an adult, and if she wants to be missing, that's fine. We'd just like to know what happened, William said. So, again, Butch Atwood, the least reliable party in this whole thing, is in this particular article is assuming that it was more of that he saw, but also stating that the driver had trouble getting out because of the airbag. So he's claiming the airbag deployed. So that means it was cut out by police randomly. And again, this is, uh, was taken to a private garage. <laughs> I mean, this is unlike any other case out there. So very, very weird. We don't know if it was more. Obviously, the Westmans, and this is supported by the transcript, by the police call log in which the most objective party, theoretically, Rhonda Marsh, who in the, in the transcript clearly states, man smoking a cigarette as reported by Faith Westman. Also in the transcript, Butch Atwood stated, he hit a pine tree. So that's two mentions of a male, zero mentions of a female, by the most objective party, Rhonda Marsh, who's simply typing up what she's hearing in the transcript, assuming that she's not completely incompetent, she would know to type accurately. And I've mentioned this before, Mora, at her time in college, I mean, she, it's not like it, in high school she was a lot thinner and not quite, I mean, from a distance in the winter, may possibly have been mistaken for a slender male. But from her most recent photographs, I mean, it seems difficult that someone would mistake her for a male, particularly if her hair was down, because Butch Atwood said her hair was down, She and allegedly Mora always wore her hair in a bun. And he said it. she did not look like the pictures, either because of that or because of something else in other interviews. He also had numerous different stories on how he saw her, whether while he was in the bus, across, or got, uh, getting... I mean, there's just so much inconsistency with Butch Atwood, the least objective party, where you have the most objective party, Rhonda Marsh, stating that in the transcript, transcript quite clearly that it's a man smoking a cigarette. Also, basic common sense would state that if it was a clear female that was out on the road in an accident, the Westmans would come out to assist or investigate, which maybe they did, 
Uh, there were other sources that said that there were multiple people at the scene before the cops got there. So maybe the Westmans did go out, but if they didn't, it would make more sense that if a lone male smoking a cigarette, they might not necessarily, an elderly couple, they might not necessarily walk out to assist if it looks like he's fine and smoking a cigarette. Whereas if it was a lone female not smoking a cigarette, or even if she was smoking, they it seems more likely that people would come out to assist, whether the Marats or the Westmans. So a lot of things don't add up. I mean, that's another one of the major assumptions. I did a whole episode on was more than even the driver because there's really no evidence that she was. And, and all of the evidence, all of the testimony from the more objective parties suggests that she was not. And yet all of these Dunning-Kruger goofs put all their blind faith in the least objective party pretending that Butch Atwood is some infallible god. Also, if there was no airbag, if it was already cut out, then, you know, Butch Atwood would be lying about quite a lot of things. Some comments on this early article here. Police are virtually certain that she left the area in a vehicle. So Betty Cracker here stating that Mora was in Kennedy dorm not far from my residence hall. I graduated in 2003, the year before. However, I still had many friends at UMass. They had a range of thoughts, like she went off to party for a short while. Sadly, UMass is somewhat of a party school and drinking and drugs are normalized. Ran off with a different guy, got lost in the woods, a lot more, a lot of the more innocent thinking. Moore lived on the wild side of campus, southwest, as did I. I didn't know that going in. I think there was a sense of invincibility and lack of understanding about danger when we're younger. A lot of kids that age take risks we shake our heads at years later. Also here, there were a few publicized student scandals when I attended, a few suicides, a girl that gave birth secretly in a UMass bathroom and committed infanticide, and a student that died of a cocaine overdose. There were probably a few more, but those stick out. So another possibly critical clue that Repulsive Wallaby brings up here is that Springfield pops up a lot in this case. I've noticed that. I still want to find out what this track team member that Mora called on Saturday evening discussed. She was one of the last people she connected with, and considering this girl's number never appears in her phone logs after that or directly before. Coincidentally, she also looks like similar to Mora Murphy. Another post here, yes, this would be interesting. I just had a thought on here, but I wonder if Mora intended to have this particular track team member join her and Kate for drinks Saturday night with her father, Fred, at Amherst Brew. In between calling Kate just before 9 p.m. and again shortly after, Mora calls the Springfield number at 8.59 p.m. Huh. Very curious. Wallaby, Repulsive Wallaby writes this, Definitely possible. Interesting that we never hear much about this other girl. Would that mean that Mora was also somewhat close to this girl, much like Kate? I wonder how well Fred remembers those times. Does anyone know if Mora had a sister on the track team? Another post here. Supposedly this track team member did not compete. So she joined the UMass... Okay, I'm trying to remember... So she did not compete before returning. She did not compete in 2003-2004 indoor or outdoor seasons. And Mora was no longer on the track team by the 2003-2004 season. And, Mar and this other track team and this other girl on the track team didn't compete that year. Perhaps they stayed close friends or perhaps the link is Kate who was friends with Mora and possibly the other girl. We don't hear much, if anything, about her. Yeah, I don't recall this other individual being uh, being discussed or interviewed anywhere. And if she was also involved in the Phillips Street address or around, I mean, it's it's quite bizarre. Another post here. How can Butch's sighting be a positive ID when he states he only saw her from the mouth up? Odd. And especially if her hair is down and possibly disheveled, obscuring a lot of her face. I mean, this is the most non-positive ID you can get. <laughs> and yet a lot of these goofs hallucinate that it's some kind of a definitive ID, ignoring all of the more neutral parties. A solid post here by Cookies is Mids. Butch's story is all over the place. All of the witnesses' stories are. Both Faith and Butch described a man in their 911 calls 
so I tend to believe that a man was there. The only stories that are raw are the 911 calls. After that, the witnesses can be tampered with, which is evident to me considering both their stories changed. Another post, exactly. Any statements given by the Westman and the Atwoods, other than the 911 calls, should be taken with a grain of salt. It's no reflection on their character whatsoever, but if law enforcement directed them to say this or that during other in interviews, they most likely would concede to law enforcement's wishes. Also, if they truly believe they were mistaken, because if they're being gaslit by law enforcement and even Fred Murray, either intentionally or otherwise, into claiming that it had to have been more there, so they, they just assumed they were mistaken and they didn't see what they actually saw that they reported in the 911 call. And it's just weird. I mean, this is children's level basics of logic and reason. And yet, in this case, there are just so many people that just fail to even meet that basic threshold of children's level logic and reason. A post by Maid of Honor here, which is quite astute. I searched now for other articles about Atwood and found on 107.7 blog from the Caledonian Record dated February 20th, 2004, quote, she was still in the car and I shined the light in her car. No description of her squeezing out or talking over the roof of the car. I'm absorbed in reading over the Westman and Marat interviews. In the two PI interviews with the Westmans, they see and hear activity around the car before Atwood arrives. McDonald's interview with Marat notes Mora could not be seen after Atwood left. Does this imply they saw her before? Question mark. Then in the PI interview with the Marats, describe a shadowy figure walking around the vehicle, no mention of the bus. So I'm inferring they saw activity when looking at the entirement of both accounts before Atwood arrives. The whitewash article doesn't include any activity before Atwood arrives. It also mentions Marat not coming out or even being home. That's curious. Another post here. It is one of the weird inconsistencies for several reasons. First, airbags deflate almost immediately. That's how they work. They inflate in milliseconds, and then the force of the person hitting them causes them to deflate. They're supposed to be essentially an air cushion. Second, in various tellings of the story in the media by Butch, she's standing outside the car or inside the car hidden by the airbags. Oh, plus all early reports say a witness, presumably Butch, said Mora was drunk. He denies saying or thinking that. That said, we can square the circle, sort of. If he drove up and couldn't really see her behind the deflated airbags, she is sitting for part of the conversation, then she gets out and talks to him. But then we're, we're stuck with another weird scenario Mora just sat there, hidden behind airbags for several minutes after her crash. Maybe, I suppose, but Faith saw a man smoking a cigarette before Butch arrived, or maybe a girl on a cell phone, I guess. So she must have been moving around at least a little bit. But that raises a question about Faith Westman's story. Let's say she accepts it could have been a light on a charging cell phone. Everyone agrees that there's no cell service at the Weathered Barn Corner. If Mora took out the phone to try to make a call, would she really hold it up to her face? There was no service, remember? If she hit dial, the call wouldn't complete. So why put the phone up to her face or somewhere where Faith Westman could see it? And even if she did, how long would she hold a phone with no service to her ear? A few seconds? And what about the airbags? Butch allegedly couldn't see her face, but Faith Westman could see a man smoking a cigarette. These details are why, in my opinion, the timeline is important. For example, as I've mentioned previously, is it possible Butch was at the accident scene before Faith called 911. It would contradict her and the Marats, but could make more sense of the timeline in some sense, while raising other questions, such as why did Butch wait so long to call 911? Or even the crazy thought I had that Butch wasn't even driving the bus that night. No one other than Butch places him at the scene. Neighbors saw a school bus. You know who else drives a school bus? Butch's wife. Maybe she has extreme social anxiety or something so that she asked Butch to claim he was the one who spoke to the driver, could explain why he seemed to hedge on details so often, who knows. That's actually a very interesting scenario. Now, we did talk about his wife possibly being the, bu the bus driver, but we didn't talk about it for a more innocent reason, perhaps, that, again, if she did have social anxiety at the time, or for whatever reason, Butch pretended he was the one in the bus when he wasn't, and that's why the story changes so much, and obviously they didn't. she didn't really see 
I mean, if Butch's wife saw Mora, or if she saw a man, perhaps she saw a man, and then at that point they were kind of dug in, what are they going to do? So, yeah. Another follow-up post here. Butch spoke to the media fairly often in early reporting, as far as I can tell. It's also possible later stories were simply quoting from earlier stories. He retired and moved to Florida several years later. But there's a few puzzling things. He was subjected to at least one lie detector test, as per his wife, and the New Hampshire League of Investigators who spoke to him thought he was lying or hiding something. To the point where John Healy went to Florida to try to speak with him. So basically, both the police and early PIs who spoke to him didn't buy his story. I can only speculate as to why, but my common sense says a few things. One, the timeline doesn't smell right. Two, Butch is the only person placing Mora in New Hampshire or with the Saturn. Three, he seemingly told Cecil Mora was drunk, then contradicted that to the media. Four, he pulled a kind of expletive move, if we're being honest. According to him, he pulled over, asked if she needed help. She said no, she was going to or had called AAA. He offered to call police. She said no need. So why did he call the cops? To get her into trouble? She asked him not to. For all Butch knew, she had used a neighbor's phone to call for a tow truck, or her cell phone did have service there. There was still in the days when early cell reception varied widely between carriers. Or maybe her friends were in another car and they drove down the street to call for a tow truck. That's an interesting point. He had no idea. So why call the cops when she asked him not to? Even if he didn't think he, she was drunk, why would he want to potentially her to get a ticket for unsafe operation or failure to maintain a lane or whatever? There was no property damage to anything other than her car. So unless the story didn't play out as he said he did, I've posted about my angry butch theory where he's basically annoyed at her for having a black car with no lights on in the middle of the road around a steep curve and acted like a jerk the entire time. Then tried to make himself look better in retellings when he realized what happened and that it, he could be at least partially at fault for something that had happened to her. Or it could be something else entirely. Another poster posted this. I would never call the cops either. I would have said, you have service? We don't have service around here. Let me call AAA for you. Only in a dire need would I call the cops, but I guess that's just me. Plenty of people call the cops for hardly anything. We had this lady on Facebook who would listen to the scanner and post, someone called the cops because the person was looking at the ground. Kid you not. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but do people up in uh, near the mountains in New Hampshire? They're they're usually not as uh, not as uh, Karen ish as city folk. Okay, the final theory we're gonna go over. Believe it or not, there was an actual modification for a theory that we haven't discussed before. If Mora really was at the accident scene, but then left, and then At would talk to a different girl. And that different girl also left. What does that mean? And let's say Atwood assumed it was Mora. And then later, upon seeing more pictures again, he said she didn't look like the pictures, whatever. He eventually realized it really wasn't Mora. At that point, is he really going to come forward and say that? Like, what did people expect him to do if it really was an honest mistake? So an interesting post here by Katarai... When did Mora disappear? One to two minutes before police arrived. So if it was 7.35, it would be one minute, 7.34, 7.35, two minutes, or 7.33, between 7.33 and 7.34 p.m. So according to this timeline, if Karen McNamara was on the scene before any police and saw Mora and picked her up, where did Mora go after that? I don't know, but... If Witness A saw an abandoned SUV nose-to-nose -nose with Mora's car, which was also abandoned. If Butch arrived and talked to another girl before police arrived, and then that girl disappeared too. <laughs> so if Witness A's account is true, there's nobody there, maybe it was Mora, maybe it wasn't, then Butch comes and it's somebody else there. So here's an interesting post by Mary Four Poaches. 
I'm coming back to Frank Kelly, a witness returning home from his or her place of employment at Cottage Hospital on Goose Lane, stated she slash she observed a black Bronco-style police unit with number one stenciled on it, past her or him, heading with blue lights flashing toward the intersection of Goose Lane and French Pond Road in swift water. Please have a map of this area to follow along as it gets confusing since these routes twist from Haverhill into the Swiftwater portion of the town of Bath and then back into the northern section of Haverhill. Goose Lane and the Cottage Hospital are in Haverhill, then in Bath, where it continues south to southwest back to the Woodsville portion of Haverhill. As the witness drove further up Goose Lane, he or she observed the police unit continue on Goose Lane back towards Swiftwater. As this witness turned off Goose Lane in Bath and onto French Pond Road and the very short distance on French Pond Road to the intersection with Route 112, the Wild Amanusac Road as it's called, almost across from the general store, he or she observed the same unit, number one, pass her or him at the intersection heading east towards where the Saturn was ultimately located. When the witness came to the corner at the Weather and Barn, he or she saw this police unit nose to nose with the Saturn, but did not see any officers or people around the two vehicles. It is assumed Sergeant Smith was at this point either speaking with the Westmans or down speaking with Mr. Atwood. The witness then continued along Route 112 heading east and flashed his or her high low beams to oncoming traffic a universal signal to slow down ahead due to the location of the accident on the sharp curve. This witness's account of what he or she saw that evening supports the postings about an earlier accident where, quote, female left in private vehicle, end quote, which was heard by others over the scanners up in that area. What does this all mean then? It means an officer was responding to a vehicle slid off the road call, but then rather than take the most direct route to the wedded barn, the officer went back to Route 10, where it intersects with Goose Lane up in the Woodsville section of Haverhill before turning back around at the corner of uh, the Weathered Barn. Could there have been two separate women sliding off the road into snowbanks that evening within 30 minutes of one another? I doubt it, but it's possible nonetheless. Huh. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't checked out the Mind Shock episode on the earlier accident, I actually go over that. There's quite a few ear witnesses on the scanner and other information to support the earlier accident. Now, what that means in relation to whether it is or wasn't is or isn't Mora, I mean, that's still, of course, unknown. So many, many different scenarios to ponder. I mean, this case really does need to be solved and solved soon. And I'm, of course, of the opinion that enough information does exist to solve this. There just seems to be certain elements preventing the information from coming to light in order to solve it. And there could also be a bunch of different reasons for that. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Maura Murray series. If you want to help support the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast or requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comments section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.